Ephesians chapter 6. Let's go back. We're going to continue on today in the armor of God. I, I trust the Lord's really making these truths come alive in new ways and helpful ways to build you in this truth of being protected by God's strength, God's armor. He, he gives us his armor is this picture Paul has been using to protect us against the wiles, the schemes, the attacks of the wicked one, Satan and his host. And so far we've seen three aspects of the armor. Things that they would put on, those military men would put on, that, that their armor, and, and so from that, Paul is giving us these beautiful truths. Truth, being wrapped in truth. Second, being protected, our vital area, with a breastplate of righteousness, the righteousness that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And third, our feet shod with the gospel, or as Lee said in closing last week, gospel shoes, so that we can be protected, that we can be stable, and we can move in the gospel of our great Savior. Today, the shield of faith, the shield of faith, Ephesians 6, our verse will be verse 16. Let's, let's pick it up again, though, in verse 13, and I'll read through verse 16. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breast, excuse me, the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And then the verse for today, above all, or in addition, take the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts or arrows of the wicked. Amen. I want to quote to you also 1 John 5 verse 4. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we, we bow to you. We surrender to you today that you would speak, that you would give life to your word, that you would shepherd your flock, that you would keep us, protect us, lead us, Lord. Open the truth to us. Give us eyes that we may behold wondrous things from your word this truth of faith, oh Lord, the gift of God, the realities of to walk by faith. Help each one in this room, uh, Lord, to have a hearing ear, to really uh, be arrested by your truth. Lead us on, beloved Savior. Take this time, Holy Spirit, for thy name's sake, for thy glory. Amen. Facing fiery darts or arrows. The children probably in these weeks are getting these vivid pictures, but fiery arrows. I mean, this sounds dangerous. This doesn't sound like just kids playing pretend war. This is dangerous, and it is. I mean, Paul really can't give more graphic, more vivid, intense confrontation language. Fiery darts, arrows. In this picture that he's giving has the reality in spiritual warfare, the battle against Satan, him attacking us, his relentless uh, attack and his uh, schemes against God's people. I suppose if we stopped right now and we took 20, 30 minutes and we went around, various ones of you could share about attacks or arrows against you this week. Some of them are much more evident in your life. You know it, you feel it, you, you, you feel the intensity of it. Sometimes it's much more subtle, it's dangerous, but I would suspect that you could share about attacks, poisonous, or in this case, flaming arrows against you. Beloved, we're in a spiritual battle. When I was converted at 10 years old, from that day on, I've been in a spiritual battle. I've been much more aware of it in my adult years, but it's a spiritual battle because the enemy is against God, he's against our great Savior, and he's against Christ's people. So we must be prepared for this warfare. And beloved, the only way to be prepared is to be strong in the power of His might and to wear these beautiful pieces of armor or to walk in these truths that we have in our Savior. 
truth, righteousness, the gospel, and today, faith. Now, in, in Paul's military illustration that he's giving, uh, we move, in a sense, we move to a, a kind of a new grouping. We've looked at three particulars, and they were items, military uh, outfit, that the men would, would, would put on. They, they would wear this. And so uh, what we're coming to now in these next three are Paul's using language about taking it up, picking them up, and using them in the battle. There's just some uniquenesses to the way the language is. But you put on truth. You're wearing the righteousness of the Lord Jesus, and your feet are you're covered with gospel truth. You're moving in the gospel that we live in and that we preach and that we delight in. We have our whole life gripped by gospel reality. But now we take these things up. He mentions the shield. He's going to mention the helmet. And he mentions a sword. These are the ones that everybody gets dramatic about. But we don't need to put one as more important than the other. They're all the armor of God. They're all what God gives us in our Savior. So in these first three pieces, those men would fix them to their body. Essentially, the Roman soldier would have the... He would be girded. He would have a shield. And then he would have those sandal boots that we talked about last week, and he would wear them, even when they were not in conflict. It was constantly upon him. But in this language now, Paul's speaking about that Roman soldier picking something up for the intensity of warfare. Everybody following me? He says, take them up. And there would be an instant moment where the horn would go off, the alert would go off, it's time for battle, and they would grab the shield, and they would put the helmet on, and they would grab the sword, and now conflict escalates. Something for us to consider, just as context of what Paul must have been looking into. So like the Roman soldiers, you and I have to be ready. The fiery darts that come will come unexpectedly, but you must remember you're in a war. They can happen in a very casual moment, can happen in a business meeting, men, can happen in watching or reading articles and things that begin to come at you, things that would affect your mind and how you view truth could be attacking you, the enemy using it. So your protection is the shield of faith, this thing of the shield of faith. Now, once again, we'll spend just a few minutes on this illustration, the physical illustration of what Paul is giving, and then we'll move to the greater reality that he's applying to us, which is the spiritual application for how it protects us. The illustration, taking the shield of faith, picking up this shield. You, any of you guys, it doesn't matter what age. Have you, did you used to have a shield? <laughs> I mean, some, you know, trash can tops have got to be the ultimate shield in the history of America. I mean, they're big, small, metal, plastic, everything. Some have a handle, some of them, you know. But you'll see kids uh, with shields. And, and so we, we get this picture. There's a shield. It's, it's a protecting you. But in the case of the Roman soldier, it's, it, was, it was pretty awesome what they had. They were, those men were totally dependent on this barrier. I, I won't even have to hardly get to the spiritual application, and you're going to get it. What faith is to protect us, what holding on to all the promises of God. But they would have these shields, and they were, they were well made, to say the least. They were like a small door, two and a half maybe two to two and a half feet by four feet, and they were wooden, thick, and they kind of had rounded edges, so they were a little bit oblong, but they would, and they had a, a handle put on them, and these men would have these shields. And so when they would, when they would crouch down it, in a certain posture, then that shield would protect their whole body during warfare. They were also covered with metal. They had a lining of metal, which meant that these flaming arrows that hit them could not catch anything on fire. Some of them, depending on what research you do, they had uh, layered with leather, leather that had been uh, soaked in a certain liquid so that they would not be flammable. The shield was not flammable. And so these, these shields were used of the soldiers when they were in absolute intense combat. They, they wouldn't be carrying them around as, as intensely when things were not at war, when the time was not in the battle. But they had them all the time. Your faith is constant, but there's, there's times where it's tested. It's attacked. It has the enemy coming against it. So primarily, a certain segment of the military had this, the shields, and they would be in the front, and they would cover the front of the line. 
There might have been hundreds. I, I think probably through the history of movies, there's different pictures that may come to your mind of these scenes of hand-to-hand -hand combat and these men with shields and then those arrows being uh, shot out into the air, coming on fire. These arrows, incredible. And so they had to have a wall of defense. When the enemy would attack, they would bow down. They would be behind these awesome shields. The flaming arrows could not hurt them. The arrows, just for the record in that time, were long with a a tip on them that they would wrap tightly in a fabric. I mean, real tight, so it would create this cloth point to it. And they would dip those in pitch, so when it came time, they'd light them. Those things would just be a flaming torch. You can imagine how horrific, how painful those would be if they hit you. They would essentially explode when they hit you. That flame would blow up. Uh, it, was, it was serious business. And so it was brutal. And so Paul is reminding us, even in the language, when we apply the metaphor or the picture here, the dangers of the enemy against Christ's people. Those men, if they didn't have shields, they could be hurt. They could be burned horribly or obviously killed, depending on where it hit them. So the shield was an absolute must. The shield, listen to this, the shield was the difference between life and and death, surviving versus being stopped, going forward versus being knocked back. You get it. You get the picture here. Paul is giving us something powerful about the Christian life. Faith. Faith. So you see, beloved, just, just in the limited perspective we have on the picture, that Paul is telling us uh, something massive in what protects us in battle. The, the enemy's attacks. I mean, you know, we don't need new books and new ideas and new creative thinking on this. We, we have the truth. We just need to, to, have to possess it and walk in it against Satan's vicious attacks. So that's, that's the physical illustration. These shields, this barrier, this, this protection for men and for the whole of the army. But second, the application. Go back to the text. Take the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked or of the wicked one. The ESV uses the word extinguish, that you would extinguish these fiery arrows that the enemy shoots at you, that Satan sends your way. Now, faith. So the shield, in the simplest way, is the truth, the doctrinal truth, and the living truth of faith in the Christian's life. That's what the shield is representing, faith. What is faith? Well, that's, that's a question that comes up all the time, isn't it? What is faith? Mac, was it Brother Conrad that said that faith was the big, the big truth in the New Testament? I mean, when he said that years ago, I thought, man, that, that's the big truth truth as it pertains to God's dealing through His Son with men. And faith, this thing of faith, it's used 280 times in the New Testament, the word faith. What is faith? We can say it's a shield. We can stay in this metaphorical language, but we miss the reality. What is faith? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, right? The evidence of things not seen. Faith is completely looking unto God. It's not a vague thing. Here's what's critical. Children, young people, everyone, faith has an object in view. It's, it's not vague. Uh, I, I kind of have faith that things are going to turn out okay. It's not just this faith of generalities out there. I, I just, I just kind of have faith that it's going to go better this next year. I have faith that my loved one is going to do better in their health or whatever. You, you people use this line to have faith. But faith must always have an object in view. Faith is not vague. It's not general. It's not you have yours, I have mine. Faith has one object in view in the Bible, and it's the glory and the reality of God in Christ Jesus. It's Him. It's a person. Faith plants its whole perspective on Him. It believes God. By faith, we live. By faith, we, we move forward. By faith, we advance. We, we're putting everything based upon Him and all that He has declared and all that He has said. Faith, that's the shield. It's going to get tested. It's going to get tested. It's not vague. Faith must have God 
particularly in our language, in our reality, Christ Jesus is who we put our faith in. We look to Him. We've put our whole life upon Him. So, a few ways of stating it. Faith is a complete trust. It's a total belief, and it's a total reliance on the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Totally. Not sometimes in these events, but in everything. It's all that you're about, you're, you're believing Him, you're trusting Him. That's one way of putting it. Complete trust, complete hope, complete dependency on God. Said another way, faith is believing who the Lord Jesus Christ is. Present tense, that He lives, that He reigns, that He's conquered. Faith is believing that, that he accomplished everything pertaining to redemption at the cross. There is no need for other sacrifices. There's no need for good works to earn anything. Faith puts all its hope in him. I'm just giving a quick, quick overview here. The realities of the biblical truth of faith. Everything that he proclaimed is true. I don't sort through it and think, well, I, I'm not sure if I can believe that he really did that. Those miracles are did he really raise Lazarus from the dead? Faith says absolutely he raised Lazarus. Absolutely he took water and made wine. Absolutely he took a little boy's lunch and fed 5,000, which was probably 25,000 or 30,000 or whatever. Faith is believing him because its object is him. It's based upon his credentials, all that he is. That's faith. That's faith. William Henderson said this, Faith is looking away from self unto God. Placing one's trust in Him for life. Because in our state, when we were born, we were dead in trespasses and sins. In sin, dead, hopeless, and we put our trust in Him. And that is faith in a, in a nutshell. So faith, beloved, is the sheep against this horrific battle in these darts, in these lies, in these things that Satan shoots at us. Faith has an authority or a power in it based upon Him. It is amazing when we read through the New Testament, the Gospels, and then into the epistles, particularly the Gospels, how faith was such a pivotal part of so much that Jesus was doing, how He was interacting with people. Who do you say that I am? Who do people out there in society say that I am? But who do you guys say that I am? What are they going to say? They're going to have, somebody's going to have to have faith in something or no faith or no belief. So all the time Jesus was speaking like that, testing men, testing women, speaking in this language about faith. Beloved, faith is for you and I to grow in and walk more in. The certainties of God and the certainties of Christ Jesus are immovable it's our faith believing more, trusting more. So it is a shield. It protects you. It gives authority. It gives grace and protection. Oh, beloved, keep in mind, the enemy is not trying to give us a little trouble. You, you, you may have somebody that you have to deal with in life, whatever that may be, at work or some other acquaintance, and, and they, they give you trouble. And you move in and out of that, and you, try to, you just try to deal with it. We're not talking about something like that. We're talking about, we're talking about a demonic force, person, a being, Satan and his host. Not a little bit of trouble. He wants to destroy you. You teenagers, you people in your 20s that are Christians, you're here today, you hear me? Trust me, he wants to destroy your life. He wants to wreck your life. Those fiery darts that he sends will explode, and they will hurt you, or they will ruin your life. It is not small. Oh, beloved, faith. He'll fire anything at you to try to cause you to quit trusting in Christ. If he can get your faith out of the way, like that shield, you move that shield out of the way, and you don't walk by faith, those errors are going to get you. And they will inflict terrible, terrible injury and hurt to your life. So let's consider, let's just consider, I felt like we ought to really hone in, faith is this, this protection the shield, and it, it says all. <laughs> Isn't it beautiful? It actually says in the text it will quench. It's able. Faith is able to quench all the fiery arrows of the wicked one. So it's, faith won't, won't go come and go in terms of if it's because of him. It's not that he's in season or out of season. It's us trusting him in all seasons. 
that He will protect us. Hmm. So it makes us consider, what are the fiery darts we see that He shoots in the Bible? Like I said earlier, if we, we took 20 minutes, what are the fiery darts that came your way this week? I'd like to mention six categories and tie them that the enemy's attacks and where is faith in all of this? Just to give, maybe give uh, a grounding back in God's Word of what it means, dear ones, to walk by faith. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even faith. I'll move through these quickly. Satan hurls slanderous thoughts about the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is one of his darts nonstop in our country and around the world today. Slanderous thoughts about the person and work of Jesus Christ. If he can discredit or remove, remove Christ from being the preeminent one, the Son of God, God who came in the flesh, then he's accomplished great things with mankind. He slanders the Lord Jesus Christ. So the, the people that, that speak in political circles and in social circles that walk in darkness, they're influenced, they're permeated by Satan's lies, and so they create and give slanderous thoughts about the Lord Jesus Christ. Satan attempts to discredit Jesus' glory and preeminence. Everything is centered on him. That's what the Christian believes. Every conversation, you have a conversation with a medical doctor, ultimately everything about mankind centers on Christ. You talk about political events, you talk about economic events, you talk about any other event in the world, raising children, whatever it is, all of it ultimately goes back to the centrality of Christ Jesus. Why am I even here? And yet Satan will slander and discredit the Lord Jesus Christ. And people who walk in the, the influence and in the darkness of Satan and his host, they say things all the time to discredit, belittle, mock, and, and diminish, cast out even any reality that Jesus Christ is the Son of God today and forever. He tries to discredit him. People will say, Jesus is not God. I mean, come on now. May, maybe a prophet. Maybe, yeah, okay, he was a good teacher. But not God. You want, to get, you want to go back and watch Paul Washer get worked up, bring that one up to him. Like he used to say, apparently, to the students at the University of Texas, he would say to him, do not sit here and patronize me about who Jesus Christ is. He was either a lunatic, which he was not, or he's the Son of God with all power. You, you, you can't start putting him into other categories. You've just blasphemed who he is. And so Satan, his darts, his arrows against people, but against Christians is to diminish the significance of who the Lord Jesus Christ is. He takes away significance in you. You won't trust him the same. You won't believe that he has all power. I mean, when he would encounter people that knew he could do anything, if I could just touch the hem of your garment, you would, I would be healed. That's faith because they, she believed in him, the person. Incredible reality to that. We, we see ourselves as so frail in this area, oftentimes. People also say, I, you know, I can get right with God through something else. It doesn't have to be through Jesus. Why don't you guys back off? There have been other centuries and other religions and other ways that people get right or they, they get right with God in terms of their sin or their problems. No, there, there's no other way. That is not right. That is not right at all. Noah and his family were survived because God was with them. Everybody else perished. It doesn't matter what pagan gods those people had in that day. It doesn't matter in our day. It doesn't matter what the ideologies of our day are. They're all submitted. They're all crushed by the glory and preeminence of Jesus Christ. All the slanders, and it's coming nonstop. But what does faith say to these slanders? Faith says this, Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. <laughs> As Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. That's what faith says. You'll probably have to say this to colleagues, family members, people you do business with. You'll have to look to them and say, oh, no, 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 no. Jesus is the Christ. He's the son of the Faith has to deflect that arrow and stand its ground, hold its protection. Faith says that Jesus was sinless, perfect, and he gave his life a ransom for my sin. That's what faith says. He gave his life as a ransom for me. He alone reconciles me to God. Now, those are things that faith, we could go to text. 
We could go to this in the New Testament. We could see this. Arrows, darts come in Christians, people of God. This is what faith says. Second, Satan hurls lies and doubts and distortions about the Bible. Ultimately, if this book gets, dis- if this gets book back on the back shelf, chaos in any land and any people will occur. This is the truth. I mean, it stands. It stands forever. And Satan, a part of his arrows against you and against me and against every Christian, is to create lies, doubts, and distortions about this, (laughs) about this book. Hath God said, come on now. I mean, it's just another book. There's, there's been some other great books in the history of the world. I mean, I, I, I can quote to you some other great writers, great philosophers, some men before Jesus even lived. You know what I want to say to them? Big deal. They died. They perished without hope, as my eighth grade Sunday school teacher said that time on the marker or chalkboard, put names. He started putting Buddha and all these different names up there. And he came to Jesus's and it said, empty. He said, what's the difference in all these men? They're in their grave. This guy's empty. Man is an eighth grader. I was already converted. That gripped me. Wait a minute here. How do we know that it's empty? Because the word of God stands. It tells us lies and doubts, these arrows that come against you. Can I really trust the Bible? Yes, you can. Faith believes it. God said it. Dr. Criswell, I think, used to blare that out on the radio. Sometimes every now and then I'd hear bits and pieces of him. God's word says it, and I believe it. And he would just go on with that. Satan's lies, hath God said. Ongoing, lies to you young people. Hath God said that you ought to be pure and chaste and keep yourself from all this wicked world until God gives you a spouse? Yeah, that's what God has said. Forget what this society tells you. That's what God says. You see, you see how, how many ways it supplies the Word of God. People will say, oh, the Bible is old. It's irrelevant. It's inconsistent. I mean, it's only the thoughts of men. <laughs> no, that's not correct. It's not old. It's not irrelevant. It's not inconsistent. I mean, evil men, I had, I had coaches and I had, had teachers in junior high and some in high school. I had college professors. They, they make a mockery of the Bible. They make a mockery of God's Word. It's, it's Satan empowered. It's, it's Satan has them. That's what I'm trying to say, beloved. These all come from the enemy's attacks. If you have a, a great uncle and you, you're with them you know, periodically, so you Christmas season or some other times, get-togethers, and that uncle is anti-God, anti-gospel, anti-Bible. He's just wrong. Whatever he says, you you can love your uncle, but you stand for the truth. I mean, it's it's just, I've had some falling outs with family members, been some hard seasons in my life. I've done some things too zealously and maybe too carelessly, but that doesn't mean this isn't true. Evil men make a mockery. They twist all these false prophets and these money men and these all these cheats that have been on the TV and different places for the last four or five decades. They distort, they twist, they pervert God's word for money, for abuse of people, for power. And we have to stand against such fiery arrows. Beloved, what does faith say? Faith says that the Bible is God-breathed. This is his living word. That's what faith says. God's, all 66 books. We don't go back to Genesis and say, oh, you know, I know some of that's artistic language. I'm not sure about that. And God created and did this and separated this. Yes, he did. He did all of that. <laughs> that's what faith says. We say that it's living, it's holy, it's authoritative on everything. You go to the Borrow money sometime in the next month or two. Just spend some time in Proverbs and write down different principles about what God says about money. And then go see your banker, a friend of yours, and just say, you know, before we talk about anything, I I just want to read 18 passages about money. Your banker would say, okay, go ahead. But you, you see my point? It's the truth. This is what God says. God says it's wrong to take advantage of people, unrighteous gain off people. That'd be good for lending organizations to hear that. Just because it's what God says. He sees it. 
You see, beloved, faith says it's a living, authoritative word. It's the whole counsel of God into conversation. Number three, Satan hurls doubts about God's sovereign rule over all things. Every time we have catastrophes, what's going on in so much of society in the last few weeks and what happens in different seasons and different turmoil and different events and natural events and hurricanes and earthquakes and social upheavals and brutal murders and people being vile and wicked and all over our country and all over the world. And, and so people say, where's God? Satan hurls Arrows. One of the things you have to appreciate about Dr. John MacArthur through the years, when Larry King used to have his program and others, when Dr. MacArthur gets here, I mean, he doesn't hold back. He, he speaks for the glory of God. I mean, he stands true. You know, Satan wants to bring doubts in your mind and my mind. Where was God in that event? Where is God today? Those are the questions. People like to make a mockery of your faith. Satan likes to make a mockery. Well, where was God? The book of Job has certain aspects of this. Where was God? Hear about this one. Your God has abandoned you. Jake Wheeler, your God's abandoned you. Have you ever had that lie? If I went around the room and said, raise your hand, have you ever felt like that? That lie is coming. I'll tell you what, majority of Christians in this room raise their hand. Your God has abandoned you. Really? What does faith say? Faith doesn't agree with that. The lie says he's not concerned about your life. You ladies that are with child and the pregnancy is a hard one and you're, 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 you're nervous, you're anxious about it. What's ahead? The baby. Will the baby turn? Is the ba All these things. I saw this with Krista. You feel it. You women, how you, you get to bear a child. It's incredible. But the enemy wants to bring lies to you. He wants to grip you in fear. In anguish, Krista had to tell the doctor one time, well, I'm just, I'm trusting God for this. I've forgotten the, the context, but she just looked at him, and he just froze. He thought she actually believes that. Yeah, yeah. He does believe it. So, beloved, when, when, when those kind of lies and those kinds of darts come against us, we, we, have, to, we have to believe God is sovereign. He's not passive. He's active. He's ruling. Faith believes it. I was coming back years ago from a meeting back in the 90s from Waco with a guy that was pretty high up in that firm. And he knew that I was a Christian, and he was not. But the conversation began to grow, and he began to test things that I would believe, giving hypotheticals, meaning he would give scenarios. Well, then what would you do on this? What would you do on this? He was trying to trap me. Finally, we got into a big topic. It's probably not worth going into now, but... He finally said, well, then what would you do on that case right there? I paused and I said, I'd seek the Lord. God will speak. I mean, he was just, it was just quiet in the car. How do you answer that? King David, God's man in that time, what did he do? He sought God. He had a lot of other opinions going on around him. His military men, other men, other people. David wanted one source of input and clarity and direction and wisdom and grace. He wanted God to speak. And that's how he lived. Faith says to those who doubt that God's in control, that God's ruling, faith says to the, to the lies of the enemy and to the lies of our generation, our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. <laughs> he hadn't changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He rules over the nations. He rules over the schemes and the evil plans of men. He rules. He, he has all power. He stops certain things and he lets certain things go for a while. But he'll deal with it. He will accomplish all his perfect work. He won't be thwarted. He won't be stopped. He won't give his glory to anybody else. He will triumph in all things. So if somebody said, you got three minutes, Philip, with the president and all his cabinet, you have three minutes you would have to at least touch on this. God is in the heavens. He does whatsoever he pleases. And he sees men. And you better put your trust in him. Number four, Satan hurls evil thoughts and accusations against us. Man. <sighs> These are hard. Forget the Senate, the, the commanders-in-chief and the different big political groups. You and I, 
Satan fires those vicious, evil, twisted lies against you and I and your children that are in the faith and your dear brethren that are in the faith. Nonstop. Evil thoughts and accusations, as Lloyd-Jones would say. So much of all this theme here about this shield of faith is what he's speaking or bringing to our minds, how we would think. He brings evil thoughts that come out of nowhere, things that come into the reality of daily life. This gets deep. This is complex in many ways. Not every thought that comes to you can you say, boy, it must have just been me. It came totally out of me. That's, that's, that's profound there, the reality of that. Satan is against you. He's bringing thoughts and accusations and evil against us. could be something that you see or hear, but it's a barrage. Things like, there's just no way that you're a Christian. There's just no way. He says that to you. Come on now, you're not good enough. Who do you think you are to think you please God? Look at your life, what you did yesterday. Look what you did last week. Look at the last five years in your life. Look what you said to that person the other day at the parking lot. There's no way you can be a Christian. The problem that with that, beloved, is everything's about you, 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 you. What about Christ Jesus who triumphed over all? Faith is not talking about, well, let's just look at my daily life. Faith is saying, I put all my trust in him. He is my life. He owns me. He has me. How are you gonna how are you gonna discredit the Lord Jesus Christ? He can't. He can't. When he says you're not good enough, we can say that's right. He is. <laughs> he crushed your head. Do you really think he would love someone like you? Yes, I do, because he said he did, and he gave his life for me. I mean, beloved, you these this is right where we live. This shield of faith is it's not some dramatic language, some neat picture. It's right where you're living this week. Sometimes you'll see your spouse and you'll feel that they're, they're under attack. You have to encourage them, strengthen their heart, strengthen their hands in God. They strengthen you. It's, it is very real. Martin Luther and all the bombardment of the wicked lives of Satan trying to crush him, get him to compromise and give up and quit taking such a stand for the Bible and God's truth and faith and justification. And Martin Luther was in his room or whatever, and it was just intense what he was feeling. You've heard that story. He picks up his ink pot, the thing that he would write with, and he just throws it across the room at Satan, telling him to leave. That, that's, that's a brother who's taking things seriously. Man, you just, there's certain places you just got to get out of. You got to leave. We got to walk away from. We can't be around. We're not going to listen to that garbage. We're not going to go there. So what does faith say against evil thoughts and accus accusations against you? Faith says, the Lord Jesus Christ washed away my sins. I'm no longer in the guilt of that. Faith says, he is with me forever. <laughs> That's what he promised. Peter denies him. And yet the Lord Jesus Christ, what he had already said, Lord, I'm with you always, even until the end of the age, applies to every Christian in every age throughout the history of God's people. We say that. We believe that. Even in our own frailty, in our own heartache of things that we fail in. We say, Christ has me. He's purchased me. We can say with great joy, there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. You see, beloved, the this thing of faith, exercising it, putting it into action, claiming the promises of God, building our life upon this. Number five, he hurls temptations to draw you away. Each of these could be magnificent, deep sermons. These areas of faith, walking by faith, and not giving in to the lies and the attacks of the enemy. Temptations to draw us away. Tempting you to covet. Money, things, power, covet, covetousness. Huge. America has it without limit, firing around everywhere. Coveting, advertising, retailing is built on some of the real realities of people just coveting. They can make a good enough car to last 15, 20 years. They could, but they got to keep selling product. They got to keep something new, something different, tempting us, tempting us in whatever it is. I'm not saying a new car is good or bad. I'm just saying that Satan is always trying to draw us in how we view things, tempting us to vanity. Man, 
vanity everywhere, right? Vanity for all ages. My goodness, Lord, help us. Help us to walk by faith, Lord. Not to covet, not to, not to be pursuing vain things. You dear sisters in the faith, you women, you young ladies, be careful. V vanity, the flames of vanity and lies and things that are wrong and deceitful, and are, they're everywhere. They're coming at you. doesn't matter if you're 20 or 40 or 60 or whatever. Hey, they're, they're coming at the sisters in, in unique ways, arrows, ways that would tempt you, draw you away from your virtue in Christ Jesus. Tempting people to lust, arrows of lust, arrows of wickedness, fleshly things, vile things, arrows coming nonstop. Just incredible. I've told the story many a time that I do take my glasses off in certain places because I just, just, I just don't want to see garbage. I, don't, I just don't want to be around that. I mean, it's just real. It's everywhere. We have a society gripped in all these things. Be careful, brothers. Arrows are coming at you. Those things are bursting. They'll hurt you. Those, those are some of the most devastating things that will wreck your life. Temptations, things that would, the enemy is using, shooting at you. And sometimes they're packaged in such a slick, quote, appealing way. Right. What does faith say? What does faith say in, the, in this onslaught of temptations and things that covetousness and vanity and lust and envy and all those kinds of things. What, would, what does faith say? Faith says that the Lord Jesus Christ is my great treasure. He, he, he's the one that sh that's to have my heart. I've given it to Him. Right? You're not your own. I'm to be a holy vessel. I'm submitted to Him. All that I have is His. I will follow Him. I will trust Him. I don't, I don't need that. I don't need to chase that. I don't need that vain thing. I don't, I don't need that lu lustful thing, that evil thing. I, I, I need Him. I need, I need purity with Him. I need communion with Him. I need my thoughts such that I can walk in His ways for His namesake. As Bunyan wrote so beautifully in Pilgrim's Progress, we only buy the truth. <laughs> what a scene. Coming into Vanity Fair. We tend to think, well, that's very American. Trust me, beloved, Italy has its vanity fair, and Britain has its vanity fair, and cities all over the world and places have their vanity fair. It's not America didn't refine it or make it. They have their own, but men and women in the faith all over the world have to walk in the truth by faith, and they have to say all the time, every day, I only buy the truth. I only serve Jesus Christ. And number six, Satan hurls slander against brothers and sisters in Christ. I mean, these, these are just six. We could have 10 or 12 or 40 because they're, they're come, they come out of the text. They come out of meaning the, the scriptures. Paul is speaking about these, these horrible fiery darts and he says they need to be quenched. They need to be extinguished. Slander against brothers and sisters. Sometimes we, we begin to believe thoughts like this, Satan's lies. Oh, they, that brother or their, that sister doesn't really love you. That, that, those are kind of things that come against you. Or, or a thought of, they don't really care for you. Dear ones, be careful what lies you listen to. That's not true. Christ's people love each other. And we hurt each other. We disappoint each other. There's times, I, I've done this many a times through the years. I, I know I've times doers have done things or whatever, and it might hurt the elders. Or, you know, we, yes, but they love me. We're in this together. These lies, they don't, somebody doesn't care for you. They don't, they don't respect you or whatever. We have to be careful. We have to be real careful here, beloved. Those are, these are ways the enemy can, can really wreak havoc with us. We don't want to go down that path. You don't want to overthink or overanalyze things. And I'm talking about just over the years, I could, I could go back and give some illustrations that would go back to some of my younger years as a Christian. Beloved, these kinds of darts, these kinds of lies will come at you and I. They'll come at our church. We're a people. We're His people. We know that we've passed from death to life if we love the brethren. That's, that's, a, that's what faith says. Here's one. Your elders don't really care for you. 
That is a lie. I can testify. Those four men love you. No doubt in my mind. I I hear what they say. I hear their prayers. I know their life for you. That's a bold-faced lie. If somebody, if you if you get that lie this week, just quench it. You have shepherds that love you. They're in. It doesn't matter if we're 12 people or we're 100. It doesn't matter. We're this, we are sold to Christ Jesus. We're his. We're sold out to him. Don't believe such lies. They'll give their life for you. They are giving their life for you. We have to, you see, beloved, faith holds on to truth. And it claims it, the promises of God, the proclamations of God, all that he's done for us. Oh, faith says the Lord Jesus Christ has made us one body. That's what faith says. We're one people. We have our struggles. We have our difficulties. Peter and Paul had to work through something. Paul corrected him. Oh, that those brothers loved each other. They esteemed each other. We're one people, and so we're committed to love and pursue joy and unity with the brethren. You with me? (laughs) That slander against a brother or sister needs to be squelched. Let love continue. Let me close. These are just applications for us to think about. Beloved, again, Paul has said, God's word has said, that faith, the shield of faith extinguishes or quenches all the fiery arrows. This week, this next few weeks, there'll be different arrows against different ones of you. Any and everything that comes against you by the grace of God, by Him in us, with us, in faith, believing Him, those things can be quenched, extinguished. They don't have to triumph and hurt in your life. They don't have to wreck your life. Think of it. Think of it. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith in His Word. Faith in His promises. I stand on Him. Beloved, take up the shield of faith. You need it. I need it. What a glorious truth. Faith. Faith is the victory. Let's pray. Father, we are just overwhelmed at the reality, the truths of this this text, this great picture here of faith. Lord, you give faith. You increase faith. You sustain us in the faith. We're growing in it. Lord, it's even today makes us all realize how much more we need more faith. Lord, we think of when others would say to you, Lord, increase my faith. Do that for us. Help us, Lord. We are careless. We, we do move in and out from behind the shield of faith. We do get caught in these arrows and these lies and these slanders. Lord, we, we, don't, want to, we don't want to listen to them. We want to believe you. We want to put all our hope in you, trust you. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you that Paul was given these truths. Lord, may may these things absolutely uh, help us. You help us. You apply them. There's different ways, Lord. These come to us, the the things that we realize in our life that are coming at us. Help the saints, Lord. Help the people. Help your people today. Keep us, Lord. We want to walk by faith, trusting you. Blessed be your name. Amen.